Good day, everyone, or good evening, or good night, whatever the case may be. I'm glad that you're joining me here as we unpack the second part of Peter's confession of who Jesus Christ is. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us on our journeys of which we cannot see the end of, on paths that are yet untrodden and through perils unknown. Grant us faith to go for, forward with good courage, not knowing where we go, but trusting that your hand will guide us and your love will sustain us. For into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all that we are, our bodies, our souls, and all things. Amen. Oh, so, let's review last week's. Jesus takes his disciples about 20 miles north of the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee into a place called Caesarea Philippi. He then asked them, who do people say that I am? They gave a variety of answers. Then he asked the big question, which will determine if we are on the narrow path that leads to salvation or the broad path that leads to destruction. He asked the question, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are, well, actually it was Simon then. Simon said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus acknowledged that Peter didn't learn that from man, but by direct revelation from the Father, which is how all faith is given granted, bestowed upon us. It's not a work that we do, it's a gift that we receive. So Peter got it right, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now comes the bad news. What does it mean that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, he's about to tell us. Not only that, people of God, but check it out. <laughs> Jesus is going to tell us the cost of being a discipleship. And, and a spoiler alert here, there's a cross involved in both of them for what Jesus is going to do and what we are called to do on an ongoing basis. So let's get right into our text. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. From that time on means from the time that Peter confessed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's a, in the Greek, it's a present tense verb. So that means it's an ongoing action. It's habitual action. And Jesus often spoke of it. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day, be raised again, back to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but rather the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must first deny me, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good, <coughs> excuse me, will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his souls, soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, <clears throat> that some who are standing here 
will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of our Lord. So we have Peter, Simon, being called Petros, the rock, the little rock, to being called Petros the stumbling block, the one who Jesus trips over. He's gone from being the rock that Jesus is going to build the big rock, the Petra of his kingdom upon, the confession that Jesus is the Christ. And now he has this terrible fall. Why? Peter hasn't changed. He still loves Jesus, but they did not have it in mind that the Messiah would be a suffering servant. They believed that, that the Messiah was going to come and deliver Jerusalem from all of its enemies, starting with Rome and filling out with the Philistines, the Perizzites, the other Eastern people, all of those, and restore Israel to its rightful place in this world. That's not... <laughs> what Jesus, it's not what the Father had in mind. Yes, Jesus is going to be a, build a kingdom, but it's not going to be just confined to this earth. It's going to be confined to the universe for all eternity. Can I get a hallelujah? But Peter couldn't see it. And we often judge Peter harshly, but really, when we get to the, when we get to the bottom of what he is saying here, he says to, Peter takes him aside after hearing that he's going to die. And I wonder why they didn't hear the part about the resurrection. Aren't we the same way sometimes? We hear the bad news and we can't get past that to get to the good part that more than makes up for the bad part. So Peter gets stuck at, I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be killed and he shuts off. And he takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him. Now, just check this out. Imagine the gall or, or, or the whatever you want to call it of someone who just acknowledged that this person, Jesus, that you're speaking to is not only the Messiah, but that also makes him the son of the living God, in effect, God. So you're taking God aside <laughs> and rebuking him. That's never a good idea, people. You're not ever going to win that battle. And he says to Jesus, who earlier he had just called him the son of the living God, <clears throat> he says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You know, the only, the Greek word for that is, um, is um, eleos. And the only other place Elehos occurs in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. And he's quoting Jeremiah 31, 34. And what that means is, Lord, have mercy. God, have mercy. So what he's probably doing is praying. God, have mercy on you, Jesus. This will never happen happen to you. I can't imagine a God dying. And the truth be told, probably a lot of us wish that we had a Superman God. A God that never went to the cross, but had no kryptonite weakness, that just came and crushed evil and stayed here and ruled us with an iron fist and a scepter that would never tarnish or break. Well, Jesus' chest scepter will never tarnish or break, and he is currently with us through the power of his Holy Spirit, and he has prepared a kingdom for us that will never fade, never spoil, never waste away. And in the fulfillment of his time, he'll bring it down into a new heaven and a new earth. He's created a place for us for eternity. But Peter couldn't see beyond that. So Jesus' rebuke is swift and sharp. He says, get behind me, Satan. It was the same words that Peter used, excuse me, that Jesus used to the devil in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Right after his baptism, Jesus is driven into the wilderness and the devil tempts him with three temptations. One, to turn the rocks into bread. 
two is to throw yourself off of this high tower because God will not allow you to scrape your heel against a stone. And the third one was bow down to me and I will give you all of the kingdoms of the earth. All of these things, <laughs> all of these things that Satan offered Jesus were things that would cause him not to have to go to the cross. Glory without a cross. That, my friends, is the devil's angle on that. And you can be sure it is a formula, people, that never works. It won't work. It's a lie because the devil is the father of lies. When he speaks in lies, he speaks his native language. There is no glory without the cross. There is no kingdom without the cross. Where would we be? If Jesus would have listened to Peter and to the devil and not gone to the cross, can Christianity exist without a cross? What would our faith be? There would still be an incarnation. There would still be a, uh, there would still be a, well, there would be no suffering and there'd be no death. There'd be no resurrection. And since God has not, through the power of those things, been able to restore us from the devil's grip, there would be no promise of him coming back to claim us as his own and bring us into the new eternal garden of Eden. You take away the cross, people, you've taken away everything in Christianity. There is no Christianity apart from the cross. And yet Peter and... <laughs> If truth be known, most of us probably fall along those lines too. We don't want to talk about the suffering. I mean, look at the names of our churches. Our Redeemer, Church of Joy. We don't have the Church of Perpetual Suffering. Who wants to go to that? But we're going to see in a little while that, that sometimes discipleship involves just that but we're not there yet Jesus said get behind me Satan for you have the things of man in mind you see it, it Jesus uses a word here that talks about his deep inner convictions because we're born sinful we're we're born selfish and because we have this self-centeredness in it it's so hard to get this God-centeredness in it cannot get an amen but when that begins to happen, when we begin to wake up that we have been claimed, that we are claimed, you know that you are not your own. You have been bought at a price, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood and suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not our own, people. When that gets into us, the very core of us will begin to change, not on our own will or desire, but by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And then we will discover life in its fulfillment in ways that we never would have thought to look for fulfillment. Because as long as we're driven by selfishness and self-centeredness, we will always miss out the better thing that God has for each of us. Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the things of man in mind, but rather, you do not have the things of God in mind, but rather the things of man. You are a stumbling block to me. I'm tripping over you on the way to the cross. Get out of my way. Get behind me, Satan. I must be first and I must be foremost. And then he comes to this discipleship part. This is where we get into the, the church of the bitter sufferings <laughs> part, because it's brutal. The Christian life is not easy. I, I don't know if anybody told you otherwise. If they say, just become a Christian and you got Jesus with you, you can walk around singing, I got that joy, joy, joy. And we should sing those things, but yet we are not, we're, we're not, we're not taken away from the sufferings of the world. We're still in this world, but we have a promise of a better world to come. And that's where we keep our minds. We keep our minds knowing that the kingdom of God is growing inside of us and it will be completely fulfilled at our human passing or when Christ returns to claim his own people. You know, a lot of people don't want to talk about how 
how hard it is to be a Christian, uh, how much demand God places on your life. I, I heard someone once say that the more they read the Bible, it e it's easier for them to become a Christian. And I'm thinking, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but it's not the Bible I'm reading. The more I read God's, the, God's Word, the more I read the Bible, the more I, I understand that God has an absolute claim on everything in my life. You know, I, when I was in the seminary, I was very blessed because not only was I in the Master of Divinity program, but I was in the graduate school because I got a, a, another master's degree in counseling. So as a, as, a, as a graduate school student, I could audit classes. And I also got pre-registration over the rest of the MDiv students, so I got the professors I wanted. So the professors that you knew that graded really hard but were like rock stars in theology and really knew their stuff, I could audit those classes. Now, maybe you don't know what an audit is. An audit is when you sit in the class, you are given the material, but you don't have to take any tests, you don't have to do any essays, you're, 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 you don't get any grade, and you don't have to worry about that. Now, there's an advantage to it, and there's also a disadvantage to it. The advantage is you can coast through it. The disadvantage is you don't get credit for it. When I look back over my life as a Christian, God forgive me, but there were many, many years that I just audited my Christian faith. I just sat there in church. I just received the blessings. I just received the information. I, I, I just took it all in, but I didn't take any tests. I didn't answer any calling. And the problem with all of that is you also don't get a grade because Jesus is going to say at the end of our lesson today that there's going to be a judgment based on what we've done here on earth. Don't audit your Christian faith, people of God. Take seriously these words of Jesus and listen to what he says. If anyone would come after me, and don't we want to come after Jesus? He must deny himself. Now, denying, denying oneself is more of an orientation to one's life not focused on self at all. It's more of an orientation of one's life not focused on self at all. So it's not great self-esteem and it's not self-loathing. It's not about um, self-fulfillment or self-emptying. It's about unself. We're supposed to put to death ourselves so that the Spirit of Christ can grow in us. And that's an ongoing pro uh, progress, uh, a process, and it happens in stages. Sometimes it's backward, sometimes it's forward. Take up your cross and follow me. Now some people will say, I've got this lazy husband, or I've got this overbearing husband, or I've got this um, child that's into drugs, I've got, I've, I've got all these things that are going on, but I, I, I've got this health issue, I've got this bursitis, but I guess it's just my cross to bear. No, that's not your cross to bear. Those are physical things and spiritual things and mental things that are happening to us because we live in a fallen world. They happen to everyone, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. To pick up your cross is specifically and uniquely a function of the Christian. It's a sacrifice that we make because we are in fact Christians. And it's not easy. The claim is absolute. Who would do such a thing? Well, who would join the military service? When I was 18 years old, I, I signed up for the Army. Three years active duty, one year active reserves, two years inactive reserves. I signed a blank check for six years of my life to the government that they could tell me where to go, what to do, any time within those six years of life. Going to basic training was Oh man, it was tough, physically exhausting, mentally demanding. Going to specialized schools and military police was also very demanding. Going to these different duty stations were tough. 
and they could tell me where to go anytime they wanted. Now, why would you do something like that? Because you signed up for it and you honor what you signed up in your baptisms. Your parents, if you were babies, signed you up for this Christian faith. And in your confirmation, you confirm that, yes, I want to continue in the baptismal vows that my parents made. If you are an ongoing Christian, if you're a regular attending uh, a church person, if you receive the sacraments, you're in His Word, you are signed up. So we will have a cross to bear. You know, the Bible doesn't just talk about the cross that Jesus carries, but the cross that we all carry. Someone once said in regards to a lot of pro baseball players and people who aren't Christian wearing the cross saying, you know, the cross is not something that should be on us, but the Christian should be on the cross. Not to be nailed to it, but as an example of giving up our lives for Christ. Follow me. I know there's a lot of voices that are calling us to follow Jesus. I mean, follow different things all kinds of things, you know, shiny things, bright things, things that promise good. And they may be good, but they're not the best. Jesus is the only one that calls us to that which is best. And people of God, the best is yet to come. So how do you discern between those voices? Well, if we're a sheep, if we're a follower of Jesus, Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know my voice. When we've walked with the Good Shepherd, when we've walked with Jesus Christ, when we followed Him for a while, and you know the game we used to play as kids, right? Follow the leader. You know, it's you follow Him around, you do all these different things, and we're following our leader, Jesus Christ. But it's I've never played a game of follow the leader when the leader just disappeared and ascended into heaven. <laughs> like Jesus did. Now we follow him through his word. We, we follow him through his written word, through, through, through the way he comes to us in the community of believers. But we all play the game, don't we? Follow the leader. Let Jesus be your leader. He says, follow me. So then he goes on to say, and he says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will find it. For my name's sake. What is the goal of our life, people? I saw a bumper sticker once that said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. My response is they win nothing. They win nothing. Because Jesus goes on to say, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? but forfeits his soul for what would a man give in exchange for his soul? I don't know what a man would give in exchange for his soul, but I do know what God would give in exchange for your soul and exchange for my soul. God would, he did. God did give his only begotten son. That's how much you're worth. That's how precious you are to God Almighty, that, that, that you matter so much to Him that He would give up His only Son, that you could come and live with Him forever. You know, we can't get stuck with the suffering part. We've got to keep our eyes on the resurrection. We got to keep our eyes on the glory that's going to come for us. That, that comes to us in little glimpses. Jesus said that some of you here will not die until you come into my until I come into my glory. And the very next verse is the next chapter, and it talks about Peter, John, and James going up to the Mount of Transfiguration, where God, where Jesus' glory was was revealed as his skin was peeled back, and they could see the glory of God that was there with him for all of eternity, not just arranged for that stunt, but has always been there. And then the flesh, the veil covered his glory again. God has promised that we will be in our glory with him if we follow him. 
if we if we deny ourselves if we pick up our cross and fall and and then follow him we all follow someone amen we all play the game and the end it comes down to this last week the question was who do you say that Jesus is this week the question is knowing that we will all follow something who will you follow and may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord amen